Yeah, you're, you're going to be my replacement in BNI. No, no, no. Oh, yes. No. Yes, yes, yes. You'll love the early morning wake-ups. I wake up They're early fantastic. to go to the gym. Mm. The one that you haven't gone to in months. I know, but it's not obvious. <laughs> it's all that matters. That's why you wear these loose shirts. Welcome to Stop Whining About Real Estate. Join us as we chat, sip, banter, and wine with the best in the biz. Grab a glass of your favorite vino, sit back, relax, and let's wine together. Welcome, everybody. We are on Stop Whining About Real Estate. I am your host, Emmanuel St. Germain. I've got my co-host, Sarah Birnbaum, and we got a good friend of mine today. His name is Patrick Dunn. He owns Atrium Painting. He is a master painter as well as a general contractor. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Thank you. Thank when you, you say master painter, like artist, like... Uh, well, so a, f- a few different things, right? <laughs> so, all right, here, here's what I absolutely love about, uh, Pat, do you prefer called Patrick or Pat on the show? But, you know, either one. People call me Pat all the time, you know? Okay. Yeah. So he has more, and I hope you brought a couple of these paint jokes because he's got a couple painter jokes <laughs> oh, that I've heard over the years. I didn't know this whole years. thing existed. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it, it's unbelievable. They're actually really funny. So he's, he's got, so Patrick and I are in our BNI networking group and he's the painter in the group and I'm the mortgage nerd in the group. And he always has amazing commercials. And so he's got a ton of personality. So I hope we want to bring that personality of you today. But anyways, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in the in the, the painting world. Yeah, well, thank you for having me here. This is actually the first time I've ever done a podcast. You really? Know? Never Welcome. ever done a podcast, never done anything like this. So uh, Sarah loves doing these. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's definitely a special treat for me. So thanks for having me out here. But it's super so by the way, so like here's what I tell everybody. Mm-hmm. This is like imagine there's no microphone in front of you. Imagine there's no camera. Mm-hmm. Keep it super simple. It's like sure. any old conversation. Like for me that that's how I like don't make it a big deal. Yeah, yeah. The millions of viewers that we have <laughs> haven't found us yet, so we're all good. <laughs> that was good. I like you made it funny. Too. Well, we got to compete with Joe Rogan, right? You know what I mean? It's, like, it's, I mean, it was between like, you and Trump. I had, I had to pick. I had to pick which one I was going to be able to get on today, and uh-huh. so luckily you were able to get us. Well, I'm, I'm glad he was busy. You know? yeah. I'm glad he was busy. <laughs> Me too. But all right, so yeah. get us started. Tell us a little bit about your how you got into painting and. And in general, and, and being an entrepreneur and starting your own company, all that stuff. Yeah, honestly, I kind of just, um, I really just fell into it. And um, I never had real aspirations of being a painter growing up or anything like that. Um, it, my father was, a, was an engineer. He was a, um, you know, a civil engineer. And, uh, you know, he uh, always tried to get me into the garage, tried to help have me help him with little odd job projects at the house. And I had no interest at all. I was like, zero interested in anything he was doing. And uh, so later on in life, I got a job in sales. Mm -hmm. I was uh, working phones, doing debt consolidation. And uh, eventually that all the laws and rules changed in that industry. And so I got laid off. It was the first time I had been unemployed since I was like 14. And uh, I was- How long ago we talk about like ballpark? uh, So this was 2005. Okay. Yeah, 2004, 2005. Yep. And uh, so, you know, I was newly married and uh, I had a kid on the way. This was totally unexpected. And so I needed to make money and I needed to make it like right now. Yeah. And so uh, I had a buddy that was a painter and, you know, he always seemed to have work to do and he always seemed to have cash in his pocket. So I called him up. And I got a job with them. And uh, I was working for an old Irishman named Desmond Fagan. And uh, he was a guy who was like 75 years old, but he was still carrying around these huge five-gallon pails of paint. Mm -hmm. And he had arms like Popeye the Sailor Man. Like a lot of people don't remember Popeye the Sailor Man, the cartoon, but he was the embodiment of Popeye the Sailor, you know? And at 75 years old, it was incredible the things that he could do, but he was really ready to retire. You know, he was just waiting for the opportunity. And, and I worked for him for about four months before he said, hey, you know, have you ever thought about starting a business? And, you know, it was, it was strange. I was like, you know, nobody's ever, ever <laughs> asked me that. Like nobody ever thought, uh, you know, a lick of spit about having me run a business. And um, so... As naive as I was at the time, I think I was 22 years old, I said, oh, you know, that could be, it's probably easy. It's probably simple, you know? And uh, 
here I am 20 years later and I'm still trying to figure it out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's so, awesome. Yeah. 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 We, I, well, it was, it was definitely, um, an experience that I wouldn't trade for the world. Uh, but it was really, really difficult for the first 10 or 12 years, you know? And, um, did you buy the, did, so did he, did you, did he like give you the book of business? Did you buy the business from him? How was the transition? Well, I didn't buy the business from him because I was, uh, cause I was broke, right? Okay. Like I didn't have any money. Sure. Uh, but it, it really, it was just kind of like a, a passing of the torch, so okay. to speak. You know, I think a lot of the guys that worked for him at the time, they were dependent upon him. And so if he would go on vacation or if he would go out of town, um, these guys were showing up at his house like, hey, boss, you know, we, we need, need to work. Them. Yeah. What, what do you got going on? So they became a lot like his children. Mm -hmm. And I think he was uh, really relieved to hand them off to me. Gotcha. And, uh, are yeah. they are a lot of those guys still with you today? No, no. Unfortunately, no. I still keep in contact with some of them. Okay. Uh, but and some of them were really, really skilled uh, tradesmen. Mm -hmm. uh, but they came with all their other, you know, vices and problems. And, <laughs> you know, and so welcome to Florida. <laughs> yes, yes. Or anywhere, really. But yes. Yeah. So it was, you know, I, I, I I'm always grateful to those guys because I didn't know enough about the painting business when I started. And so I learned a lot from them, but, uh, but quickly I learned too, that they were, they were kind of like their own obstacle. They were their own worst enemies. Mm -hmm. right. And, uh, so we had to outgrow, you know, we outgrew each other and, Fair. you know, that happens. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I want to talk about getting, uh, you know, the, the, the becoming an entrepreneur and some of the challenges, because I think there will be something interesting, but before we get to that part, what I, what I want to do is that, from a painting perspective, right? We're a real estate show. Like, why do we have a, a, a painting contractor and a general contractor as yourself on here? I want to talk about some of the stuff that I know you shared with me in terms of, you know, the greatest investment that somebody can do to move the needle on the value of their home is paint. So talk about some of what you do, how you've seen it work uh, in terms of like, I, I don't mean just beautifying my house, but also like you're increasing the value of people's homes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I ask people this all the time and I say, you know, if I told you that I could give you an investment that would give you 100%, 110% return on that investment, would you be interested? And they say, yes, of course. And I say, well, you know, according to the National Association of Realtors, when you paint your house before you're prepared to sell, you will get that money back 110%. Uh, so not only is it going to make your house more desirable compared to your neighbors and compared to the other, you know, competitors out there, but you're going to get that money back in the sale. Um, and so it's, I think for a lot of people, it's a no brainer, particularly when they're putting it on the market. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, that's, people go like, so if they're, all right, so here's a question for you, all right? So Sarah's out shopping for a house. Sarah's got particular tastes. She likes lots of yellows and, and, and fun colors like that. No, I'm just kidding. Who, know, who knows whatever she's looking for? But the point Pink's is, is that, <laughs> so I get the concept of painting before, so it makes the house look newer, but am I hurting myself in the ability, like if I'm painting my house and I went white, let's say, is Sarah going to want, the, as Sarah, the buyer, going to want the White House, or is she going to want to hire you and paint it again? Or, do, like, how does that work? Am I better off saying, hey, I've got an amazing painter, I've already worked out a deal, and I've already paid for it? No. Right? A lot of people can't envision. They have to see it look really, really good to understand that they can make it whatever they want, but they need to see it look really good and clean first. Mm. So if I wanted to go in and paint it pink everywhere, but he had already painted it, I might hire somebody to go do all of the, you know, the specialized stuff that I want to do. But if it was an old paint job and it was, you know, cracked or whatever, I wouldn't be able to envision my end goal. Because so me having, as, a, as the seller in this example, mm -hmm. having already paid for mm -hmm. and having it ready to go, credited with, a, with the painting contractor, with Atrium Painting, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you think that... It wouldn't, it wouldn't, you, you don't think it would be as good as an incentive or you think it's just from the drive by you would, you would have a hard time imagining what, how pretty the house could be. Even the drive by. I mean, mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I think that that, I think if you, 
you see pictures of a house. Like, that's why they say get professional photos done. If the pictures are crappy, nobody's going to even make the appointment to go see it. Mm -hmm. If they don't even like the front of the way that it looks or it looks worn down or it looks not well taken care of. Well, I have an app. I just got an idea. Oh, boy. I have. A, th ladies and gentlemen, this is how it happens. <laughs> it is just like this. We are going to create a filter for real estate. Okay. Okay. I complain about this all the time. Mm -hmm. Women use filters. They don't look <laughs> anything like what is on the filter, right? What what, yeah. what you see and what you thought you were getting. So are we, are we catfishing real estate now? Is that what we're doing? Yes. No, but what I'm yeah. saying is, but th what I'm saying is that the concept of a filter. I don't know why somebody feels the need, but either you're making you're trying to make yourself feel good or you're trying to make an audience believe you look a certain way. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we want to do that with a house? Mm. Right. And then they get there. All right, show's over, there. guys. I, I, my idea is over for the day. It's like Problem when your solved. dates show up, you know, you're like, ooh. No, but think about it. Like, I, I think, like, that's, you know, it's a filter. Like, it basically says, like, you, you they they must have this. This is AI what the house must could be look there. like. Right. And then it's, you then use it's got that his picture, information on it. And then you put the, right. And then call Patrick at Atrium and we well, can do this your for you. It solves the problem that you were saying that, hey, if the house isn't pretty, I don't want to look at it. At the same token, my economic and efficient brain says, why would I pay for him and then you pay for him again if you don't like the color I chose? Mm -hmm. Like, but why do you care if you can list it for an extra five grand? I'm already going to list it for an extra five oh. grand because I've pre-negotiated <laughs> into my sales price. Oh, to get it painted. To have it painted, but the color of your choice. Do people do that often? You know, I've I've never had anybody do that before. It's too smart of an idea. <laughs> I get it, ladies you know? and gentlemen. Use this idea. I, you know, I like I like your thinking. I like where you're going with that. I mean, I, I would like a say, voucher, right? Yeah, like it's a like voucher. a home warranty. Yeah. Listen, people do it all the time. It's like I, I keep telling people this. People don't care if a house is four hundred thousand or four hundred five thousand or four hundred ten thousand, unless you're paying cash. Like. All those numbers are all the same. The more perceived value that you can include in your offering, the better it is, right? Certainly. You go to a restaurant, $50 a meal sounds like a lot. But what if it was $70 a meal, but it includes your, your appetizer, your meal, your dessert, and your salad? You know, like mm -hmm. all of a sudden your brain is able to compute it differently, Certainly. Right. It just feels like there was a greater value because you were able to add up the different amount of things going on there. So for me, if I was selling a house, I would build all that stuff into my sales price. Hey, I've pre-negotiated the house to be painted. And then now all of a sudden, let's say if I was a listing agent and I was doing that with you, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that if I refer you five paint jobs per month, I'm going to get a better deal for my clients. So now it's saving me money. But however you do it, a home warranty. I would build all this stuff into the sales price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I think it would certainly have to depend on, you know, circ certain circumstances. Because you're absolutely right in saying that, like, a first impression is so important, right? Mm. Particularly when it comes to, to real estate and when it's somebody's home mm. and not necessarily an investment. Um, you know, those first photos that they see online make a big, big difference. Um, so I, I like it. I like it in that sense. I like it in that sense. I think there's also a value that people... Um, you know, having a turnkey service, right? Like mm -hmm. we're ready to move in, you know, we just sold our home. We've got a limited amount of time, you know, are we going to wait for these renovations or painting, you know, to be done and completed? Um, so although I don't know that it's a necessarily a, a, a solution for all, I like it. I like it. I think it's actually a pretty great idea. We're going to test it. We've got, we've got our next guest is going to be a, a real estate agent. So we'll mm -hmm. test it with her and see what she thinks mm -hmm. and see what she thinks about filters on houses too. Mm. Let's see if we're <laughs> ready to go there. Tell us a little bit about the, the, the entrepreneurial part of, of being a painter of being a contractor um, in general. Right. So, you know, what's involved with it? Like what's a day to day? Like, how does it work? Like, you know, you've got how many guys work for you? Say, like, how big is your insurance? team? So our, our team, um, you know, our team sort of changes on a daily basis, right? We sort of expand and contract as, you know, uh, demand projects, uh, changes, maybe? projects, um, you know, just, yeah, we, we so hire. Where do you find, so, all right, let's talk about that. Contracting's sure. easy. Hey, sorry, Sarah, I got to let you go. I'll call you, you know, you, you're great, but I'll call you on the next job. Right. Right. All right. How do you grow? 
Well, that's, you know, what I've found. Where are you finding people is, I guess, what I'm getting at. The Sarah that's yeah. sitting there waiting for the call for the next job. Is there, there's right. a lot of Sarahs <laughs> like that. I get it. They're very, they're very replaceable. <laughs> Uh, well, what I found out oh, in my God, business, <laughs> uh, you can have one. It's called stop whining. You can have a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It is stop whining. It yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, what I what I found, uh, you know, not right away. It took a long time. Like the learning curve was steep for me in business. If I'm being, you know, quite honest about it. Okay. Um, but you know, what I found is initially I was hesitant to hire subcontractors. Right. Like there's a certain stigma behind that where people are like, oh, you're hiring subcontractors. And as opposed to hiring an employee and having a, them fully a, responsible. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, so so just to explain to people, so the subcontractor is a third party that's working for you on that project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The benefit for you as the, as the general contractor is you don't have to pay their insurance. They have to be, or do you pay the, the insurance? How does it work? Well, we if, still, I'm, if I'm the seller, like, is there a benefit to me or is it just to you? I mean, the benefit to me is that a we can we can expand and you know we can we can scale as needed. Got it. Um, the other really great benefit to me is that now you're hiring people that are very specialized in that one area, right? Got it. These are small businesses, so their mindset is the same as my mindset. Uh, they're not there to they're not working by the hour, right? They're working by the project. So we're we we are both stakeholders in the uh, satisfaction of this one client and. Uh, what I found out early on in business was that, uh, you know, initially I was almost like a little bit threatened by that, you know, and, and people were saying, what are you doing? You're, you're here. You're like developing your own competition in a way. I mean, uh, probably the best example is a guy that's worked with me for almost 14 years now. And, you know, I drove the truck and he rode shotgun and eventually he was uh, managing my crew and he was managing my full-time employees. And then he, he grew out of that and he started his own business and people were asking me like, how do you feel about that? You know, like, and I think initially it seemed threatening, right? Like, is this person going to take my customers? Mm -hmm. And quickly we realized that, uh, you know, I was his biggest customer, right? Uh, my value, his, you know, my value to him was that I was worth thousands of jobs over the span of his career. So that, you know, that bond, in addition to a subcontractor agreement mm -hmm. meant that, um, you know, we, we stuck together. He didn't, he doesn't want to steal my clients because I've already done the legwork of finding the business for him. Uh, but it was, you know, the, the, the insurance requirements are different. Uh, now we're, you know, he's got to pay for his own workers comp insurance. Uh, but we still hold our own workers comp policy. We, we still have an umbrella policy that if somebody walks onto our job site on day one, they're covered by workers comp. Right. Um, we have our own general liability and now those folks have their own general liability too. So in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a great benefit to a customer because they're essentially like doubly covered by insurance. Uh, but then they're also getting somebody that's very, very specialized in their field. Right. Um, you know, I really don't want to hire a handyman to do my roofing, to right. do my plumbing, my electrical. Right. I want to hire a painter for, as a painter. I want to hire the Mason as a Mason. And, uh, and so that's, what's made the most sense in my business. Okay. Is, How, mm -hmm. wh what's the average turnaround time? So like, I remember the first time, so I bought my house in 2014, I closed at the end of 14, you guys mm -hmm. redid it recently. Um, but when back then I was, I was kind of shocked. I, I think it was the first time I'd ever seen like the, the, that you guys are the blow the paint on. I don't even know what the, the proper mm -hmm. terminology is, yeah, but like yeah. it was, mm -hmm. it was like, it was crazy. It was like, it, it goes really fast. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. well, mm -hmm. I mean, Sarah, you don't just take a little paintbrush. Like I understand. This. So I, I was shocked. So how fast can you do a house? Oh, well, um, so uh, interior, exterior, like, yeah, I mean, we've, we've done homes in a single day before, you know, that's All uh, right. But in 2005, uh -huh. when you started, is that, oh, what, yeah, it was very different. No? Oh, certainly. Certainly. It was very different. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was just getting started and I, I could spend a week on a, on a house, and, right. you know, and then over, over time you sort of learn the tricks of the trade and you get introduced to new people that, you know, have different skills and different talents and, uh, and things really ramp up. But but yeah, the guy who taught me how to paint, you know, he started out, he was actually a part of a painter's union and they were trying to block the use of, of rollers, right? Mm. Rollers that, that long ago in England, you know, wow. uh, they, they, back then they used a huge 
block brush, and that's where they painted everything with. That's why you had the big forearms. (laughs) That might be where that came from. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But he still had his block brush, and for him, that really... uh, that was a significant investment for him at that time. Yeah, you know? it's like a chef and their knives. Yes, yeah. Oh, good yeah. analogy, Sarah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do you have good knives? I do have good knives. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't know. I invested in some. I, they're, they're okay. What? I know. I like You're to like, cook you too. know, the Instagram chef. Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, I cook like every night. Look at me. Oh, very funny. That is true. It's either boo boo or it's like what you just made that evening, you know? But you know what's better? <laughs> How many selfies do you see me do, Patrick? Not very many. Not see? very many. That's true. Oh, well, there you that go. That is true. <laughs> my my none, priority and is he doesn't my dog use filters. And, cooking. <laughs> and I definitely don't use filters. No, not a fan of filters. All right. So the industry has obviously changed quite a bit. You've, you've, grown along with it mm-hmm. um the technology you guys like so what what kind of projects do you do you work on commercial residential dog houses like what, what do we do <laughs> <laughs> yeah everything yeah the whole gamut and everything in between uh certainly um, okay one of the projects that we just finished was uh, just outside of uh miami international airport and there's a property manager that has a large portfolio of commercial buildings and this was the first time we've done a lot of commercial buildings for the same customer uh, but usually they were sort of spread out, like one at a time. And, you know, these are 200,000, 300,000 square foot buildings. And in this case, they said, listen, we've got nine of those. Wow. Yeah, we've got nine of those. And we've got three months to get them all done. Okay. And uh, some of their tenants, some of their clients are people like Amazon and their Jim Threlkel, of, you know, the florist and big seafood distributors. So each one of those uh, each one of those clients have their own individual needs and requirements, right? And uh, coordinating everything is, is tough. Yeah, yeah. Amazon is a particularly interesting uh, animal to deal with, right? Uh, they were asking us to install safety rails on the bill on the on the roof of the building in order to paint it initially. And we said, Oh, because they didn't want to get sued. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we're not we're not even stepping on your roof. You really need just that? in case. Yeah. Just in case. Just right. in case. All right. Well, speaking of airports, something that is pretty, uh, pretty special and pretty cool about Patrick, you're a pilot. I am. I am a pilot. Yes. He he flies for like fun in these small planes. That's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I really, really love it. How did you get into that? When did you, yeah. How did, let's talk about that for a second. (laughs) All right. So that was, that was always sort of like a small dream of mine as a kid growing up. And, uh, one day my daughter and I, my daughter was home from school for some reason. Right. And so she stuck palling around with me going to clients, you know, going to job estimates and seeing clients. And we were passing by Fort Lauderdale executive airport. And uh, I remember at one point when, as a boy, my parents had taken me to, like, a flight simulator. And it was so cool. Like, you actually get in this thing and it moves around with Mm -hmm. you. And I said, you know what? You know, this has got to be the most boring day of her life, right? Like, driving around with me. Let's go try out a flight simulator. And my client happened to be right next, you know, right next door at the Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport. So we stepped in there and uh, got her in the flight simulator. And I got talking to the guy at the counter. And the guy says, you know, you can get your private pilot's license in, in about 40 hours. And I said, 40 hours? Jeez, you know, I could do that Monday uh, by Friday. I'm a pilot. <laughs> you know what I mean? That will be simple. And uh, it, it, I said, well, how much is it? He says, it's about $90 an hour. And I said, wow, that's really not what I expected at all. Mm-hmm. And um, that's another one of those examples of how naive I was at the time because, you know, about a hundred hours into this and I'm still trying to get my private pilot's license. Right. (laughs) And, and and I I asked the guy, I said, you know, you told me, uh, you told me 40 40. hours. He says, well, what do I know? I'm not a pilot. I just, (laughs) yes. Yes. And I said, really? Uh, I sweep here. I'm just the janitor. (laughs) (laughs) I read a sign years ago. Yeah. But it was already too late. It was already too late. You were in it. I was, I loved it. I absolutely loved every moment of it. And if I could have, I love my business. I love being an entrepreneur. But if I could have, I would have gone back and I would have probably done more in the aviation industry. And I'm trying to figure out ways, like particularly now with everything that's happening in Tampa, mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out ways where I can sort of utilize that that pilot's license to to expand my business and grow, you know? Well, all right. So let's talk about that. What about, uh, what about drones? So mm-hmm. the, like, Drones he are mis- wants to be in the air flying. Well, I do too, by the way. So Top Gun was one of my favorite movies. And I have, I actually have a buddy of mine, Rob, 
who's a pilot. And I was telling him that in Tampa, they have this thing that you can pay to go. It's not quite a, uh, an, it's not an F-16. And I forget what, I forget the, the, what type of bird it is, but they have you go in and like, you're in the back and like you're goose in this, no like, kidding. and you get to like spin and they do all these, like all sorts of cool things. And I was like, wow, that sounds like so much fun. I'd love to do it. He's like, oh no, he's in, he's South African. He's like, oh no, mate, I forget. I'm not even going to attempt the accent. I'll, I'll <laughs> screw it up. But he's basically like, no, oh, no, no, no. My buddy's got a MIG in uh, Minnesota. We'll go there and I'll fly that for you. And I was like, oh, like, it just yeah. seems so cool. I love, love, love the idea of flying like that. Yeah, yeah, I love speed and I hate heights, but planes, you don't feel like that. <laughs> you know? It just feels so different. But what about you? All right, so back to business. What about using it as a drone? Like, do you do you have a drone, I'm assuming, or no? I do. I do have a drone. Do yeah, you, yeah. Does it feel like flying or not at all? Um, it doesn't feel like flying. It doesn't okay. feel quite like flying. But I did I did a job for uh, one of um, uh, Mike from b and I, I did okay. a, a job for one of his clients he had a commercial building in fort lauderdale mm -hmm. and we had to restucco the entire exterior and everything and so i wanted to get some shots of it some aerial shots of it and as i started to try and fly this drone i realized we're in uh fort lauderdale executives airspace and in, in order for to get shot down <laughs> <laughs> that would have been very cool that yeah, would have been would very be. cool <laughs> uh but but well before that they make sure that you get clearance and that you've done uh you know a weather briefing and everything else and for me that was kind of shocking because it was the first time i had flown a drone inside you know uh delta airspace right. but as i was like oh i already know what to do you know i already know all this stuff and so 40 I, hours with my, yeah. At this Plus now, 50. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. 140 hours. Right. So yeah. it was good for something. They say an <laughs> air traffic controller is the most stressful job in the country. I can imagine I that can imagine. it probably yeah. is. It's supposed to be well-paying, but it's supposed to be extremely stressful. Yeah. I think they even have, like, certain personality tests that you have to pass. Oh, wow. Before they'll even let you up there. Manuel's going to sign up for the test just to see that he passes it. No. <laughs> no, I don't really, like, I'm not a test person. My mom wants me to take all these personality tests. I'm like, nah. Why does she want you to do that? Because uh, she's a Virgo analytical like us and <laughs> trying to figure out why I am the way that I am. <laughs> the, I love uh, her so much. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we going with all this? So, all right. So let's talk a little bit about, because I know it's, you do the epoxy on floors too for garages? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So That I want. Yeah. Yes. I got you a customer. I got a there referral you go. for you. That I do want. All right. Like, Sooner than later, yes. Yeah. It's it make have you if, if you ever seen my garage? It, like I love it. It makes it look cool. Makes it look tough. Mm -hmm. You know, like it and debris, easy to clean, all that stuff. So, I know he definitely can do that. So, epoxy. What are some other stuff that we haven't talked about? Some of the things that you can do in case somebody wants to use your services. Yeah, I mean, um, well, I, again, most of my career has been spent in the painting and waterproofing business. But over the last five years, when you say waterproofing, what does that mean? So painting, we know we can, we can imagine what does waterproofing mean? Certainly. Yeah. So there's a lot of work that we do with for all the like, Sarah's. We, there's something called simple Sarah's uh -huh. and all the simple <laughs> Sarah's out there. I Reason somehow, number 5,000. <laughs> uh, so yeah, water, I get that a lot. People ask me about that a lot and really waterproofing and painting are, are kind of hand in hand. Um, we do a lot of we do a lot of work with roofs now as well. Like liquid applied roofs uh, is a, is a huge thing, particularly for these commercial buildings. So that's part of what we do, uh, as well as just identify places that are leaking on buildings. Water intrusion is probably like the number one destroyer of of property and assets here in Florida, in particular. Mold. So yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. That's mm -hmm. exactly. There's a whole industry out there just for that, right? Yeah. Mold remediation. Yeah. I'm dealing with it at my house right now, but it has nothing to do with my roof. Yeah. No, it has to do well, anyways it's yeah it's a nightmare pain in the butt yeah yeah well people always consider you know they always think of it from the roof down right but they always forget that the walls are also a place where that can happen windows right. even like you know your foundation right you have no idea how many times i've had to dig out a foundation and waterproof it from from underneath yep. uh, just because the water table is a little too high in that area or something so so we got waterproofing painting we're doing the epoxy uh uh flooring for garages what else are you able to do uh well we're currently building an addition for a client of mine um there's a ton of stuff that we've that we've done there all the drywall the kitchen and the bathrooms 
uh, everything from A to Z, really. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's it. it what, we started to realize how important it was to become a general contractor, uh, sort of like year 14 of, of being in the painting business. I think we had just developed a reputation where people trusted us. And, you know, we always had the people that they needed. We were always there when we said we would be there. Which and is they, huge. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Because a lot of people don't show up. They don't show up. Or they show up two days late. Yes. Or they show up and they start and they don't finish. Yeah. That's a huge problem down here. I know yeah. down here for sure. I don't get it. Why? I feel like it might be that it's we're kind of a transient society, yep. right? Like. There's that. There's a lot of people that will come and start the job and take money and then disappear. Because of yes. those vices? Because of those vices, <laughs> yeah. They get no, that like, paycheck on Friday. It's known that there's kind of a, bad, show up on a Monday. bad rap that goes with people that, you know, do stuff in the house. They they show up and then stop or they say the job is going to take a month and it ends up taking six because they lose people. And, like, there's just – it becomes a nightmare for homeowners. I know that. Yeah. Okay, well, so let's So being dependable is probably, like, the number one thing that people would want and look for. Yeah. What about, so do we have, I don't, this is like a dumb question, but do we have trades unions down here or no? And this is a right-to-work state, so there's there there are some sort of, there are trade unions that are around, but it's not like the trade unions that you have in, in New York and up north. Uh, so this is not a political uh, question or conversation whatsoever, but if... Tradespeople, let's say all painters were unionized mm -hmm. in that way. Do you think we'd have a problem of tradespeople showing up to work or no? With yeah. that, so, again, so forgetting the politics and how you it can be corrupt and all the other stuff, like staying away from that for a second, just go utopian. Does having a, a, a like a, a governing body that basically says, you know what, John, the subcontractor, like you've got three complaints against you, you're out. You can't get union work anymore. In my knowledge of working with unions, because when I lived up north, we had a lot of union workers in the hotels that I worked in. Okay. Um, the union body is usually there to protect the union, not the people that have the consumers the using the grievance the towards the people in the union. Okay. So you think it only works one-sided? So I, my imagination would say if somebody in a union got so many complaints, at some point there would have to be some action taken. Have you ever worked in a union? I've never worked in a union, no. Have you guys? Roy, Jean? No? Me either. I had never encountered anything until I, wor I was in Philadelphia. And in the city, there's a ton of union workers. Um, I thought during my stripping days we were going to start a <laughs> union, but uh, I wasn't. Yeah, there, in, apparently, there weren't enough of us that were uh, willing to uh, contribute a little bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Some people have more to contribute than others, apparently. <laughs> well, I, I think you you mentioned something. Thank a you, Janine, for catching that joke. Sorry, I didn't get it. Oh no, I got it. <laughs> my reaction level. We don't need to make today. a social media clip out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe That's it'll help be your a dating. Great snippet right there. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. Back to business. Mm -hmm. So, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. what's the best part? What's your favorite part, and what's the the part you hate the most? Uh, well, I'm a people person, right? I love people, and you know that's that's I think what's drawn me in, you know, further over the years, right? Like even through the frustration and everything, is that I, I love meeting new people. I love the people that I work with currently. Um, so that's that's probably my favorite, you know, above and beyond. You and Sarah have that in common. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're so right. Working, like, the, the people you surround yourself, like, if you can have fun going to work, it makes a world of difference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. All right, so we love the people. Mm -hmm. What do we hate? Um, Wine for us a little bit. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, I guess I love the people. And sometimes you hate the people. You know what I mean? 100%, just like Sarah. <laughs> right. It's kind of a double-edged, it's a double-edged sword there, you know? Yeah. And uh, that's probably one of our biggest, uh, one of our biggest obstacles that we have to tackle on a daily basis is that you've got some customers that are really, really great. And then some customers that are really not so great. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people that you want to avoid at all costs. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> not, not only, uh, you know, 
it's not, it's not even about the money. It's, it's more of just, they suck the life out of you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there's some folks that are just not going to be happy and it's almost like by design, right? It's almost like a tactic of negotiation mm -hmm. to, to not be satisfied. Do you think it's a negotiation or do you think they're just miserable people in life no matter what? It could be both. It mm -hmm. could be both. Mm -hmm. It could be both. And, uh, you know, I've almost sort of developed a sense for it before I even get involved uh, with folks. So we're doing our best to try and steer clear of them. Uh, but once in a while, you know, they're kind of like wolf in sheep's clothing, you know. And uh, so over the years, we've had to deal with a lot. I won't name any names, even though I'd like to. I'd really like to put them on blast, <laughs> you know, if I could. Uh, but, you know, we're kind of thinking of some ideas in the background about how we avoid uh, those types of people. Like, you know, we have Angie's List, right? Or we have mm -hmm. these other listing uh, websites that, you know, they rate uh, mm -hmm. contractors, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in a lot of ways, I feel like we should be doing the same thing for, for customers. Customers, like Uber. You can yeah. rate, you rate your, your, the, the passenger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think there I, you go. There's your idea. I'll take it's all not my idea. That's I, I didn't come up with it. I just did. <laughs> the um, I, you know, I think the I think there's two ways to look at that, too. So like for me, like when I would what I hear out of that is, all right, number one, like, all right, is the client have an actual grievance? Mm -hmm. If they have a grievance, let's fix it, be done, move on, right? If the client is just complaining to complain and they don't actually have a grievance. So, like, for me as, as, a, as an employer and as an entrepreneur, I have to listen to co complaints about Sarah and, like, <laughs> how she's dressed and her behavior. And, like, it's very much like a parent, right? Yeah. And so... <laughs> um, some of them are they like are, are is there actual substance behind this complaint mm -hmm. or is it just some real estate agent <laughs> who was hitting on her and didn't like that she wasn't like responding back the right way sure. and like but no I mean I'm using Sarah as a bad example but just but it's true like you've got to because as the employer for me like I always want people to be happy but I will stand up for my people if you're in the wrong. Yeah, I was going to say, do you have to, like, have you ever walked away from a potential job because you're just like, this is never going to go? Oh, yeah. Right. Like, this is this is going to be more torture than it's worth, and I'm just going to save all of us the hardship, and we're just going to, thanks, but no thanks. Yes, 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 yes. And I've, I've uh, you know, breathed a sigh of relief yeah. when they finally, you know, did reveal who they were and how this was going to go. And, uh, it, and more and more lately, too, where we kind of dodge bullets uh, right out the gate, but there's a few times where you get caught, mm -hmm. you know, where you get caught. And what I've, what I've found is, you know, back, back to, to what you're, you know, back to what you were saying, are they actual real grievances or not? And probably the toughest part of my job anymore is to really listen, mm -hmm. right? Listening, it sounds like an easy thing to do. And, and sometimes it's just not. And, um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with a, with a gal about how, the toilet didn't match the toilet seat in terms of color. Like they were a different off white. And I, I literally timed the conversation and it went on for about, <laughs> it went on for about an hour and 45 minutes, you know, and I'm sitting there in the truck while everything else is going on around me outside in the job site. And, you know, I, we, we, we talked about everything from her recent divorce to, there it is. Yeah, you, it could be that. It doesn't necessarily have to be that. But no, but there's other things in her life making her mad, and so this is going to be the thing that she's going to stick to for the day. That's the one. Yeah. That's the one. And, you know, it took an hour and 45 minutes, but she finally got over it, you know. Therapy session. Therapy. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> that's what it was. And she ended up being a happy customer at the end, you uh -huh. know. But, but she made everybody miserable in the process. And I had my guys calling me saying, listen— I can't work at this job site anymore. It's yeah. just not a friendly environment. And that's all it took, you know, was just was just listening. You know, was just listening. We used to, uh, in the car industry, we used to have a line we would say when somebody was was being a dick. And we would literally say, like, hey, Patrick, I'm, I'm sorry you've had a bad experience somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you how this experience is going to be totally different, but let's start off fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, and kind of just kick someone off of the, hey, you know, it's okay if you've had a bad day. I'm happy to listen to you, but, you know, like, let's – don't take it out on me. I'm not your – you know, I'm not Absolutely. your punching bag. Absolutely. <laughs> and, I, you know, 
But you have way more patience than I do, because an hour and 45 minutes would have been an hour and 44 <laughs> minutes longer than I would have put up with that phone call. I knew there was a very nice— He turns nice, them over to me. That's, that's when I take over. <laughs> that's what I— Sarah, this customer really wanted you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now I see why I got turned over to this. Yeah. But yes. Well, we've, we've started to develop sort of like qualifying questions for, for new potential clients, right? Uh, so that we can kind of avoid that right in the beginning. And what you said— are you cheap? <laughs> right, right. No. no. <laughs> are you going to complain? Like, what are you? Or give us some examples of the qualifying questions. Well, so number one qualifying question: Have you ever worked with a contractor before? Okay. You know, what was your experience like with that? Yeah. And if they start reading off a laundry list of all these people that have cheated them and you know made their life miserable, then you you can be pretty sure that I'm I'm not going to be that you know one out of a hundred that makes you happy. Right. Right. Yeah. They're so, already defensive. They're already right. They've okay. already feel like that. You know. They They're already going feel into like, it pre-pissed off at you because yes, of everything else that's happened. Exactly. Yeah. All the baggage that goes along with Any that. other major important qualifying questions? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is like, what's your motivation for doing this? Like, what why are you why are you painting your house? What are you what are you doing this, you know? Um, what phase of this are you in? Uh, are you in the budgeting phase or are you uh, have you gotten permission from your HOA to do this? Gotcha. That sort of thing. So there's a whole litany of questions that we've kind of developed. Not everyone applies for every client, uh, but, you know, you can usually feel your way through that and see who's serious and who's who's just not going to be a fun, a fun customer, right? Gotcha. So, all right, as we wrap up, I want to give the audience some advice. Mm -hmm. So give the world some painting advice. The, the Well, actually, two things. I want you to... Give advice first, and then I want you to sign us off with one of your painter jokes. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to warn you guys, all right? I want to warn you guys. In the world of humor, okay, the painting humor is very slim, all right? Very it's, slim and narrow. It's got to be more than the mortgage humor. He's very funny. I'm telling you. It's got to be more than the mortgage humor. I didn't realize there was mortgage humor. There isn't. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess the, the number one thing, particularly in the painting industry, is painting is one of those— I'm a, I'm a great example of that where it's a person who started with nothing. You know, I didn't have a bunch of equipment. I didn't have a whole lot of money. And I started a business by knocking on doors. And, um, you know, what I found is, is that in, in the process I had uh, learned a lot. And, uh, you know, sometimes at the expense of a client, you know. So it, it, in retrospect, it would be really important for people to hire, you know, contractors that are licensed Hire contractors that are insured and make sure of that. Make sure of that. So that's the number one thing I would mention. And if you do hire a licensed contractor, you have uh, you have leverage through the state of Florida through something called the Florida Homeowners Recovery Act. So for any of those clients, and once in a while, if, if I get if I've if I've had a client who answered this question where they had a really terrible experience with a contractor, then I'll give them this information which is that if, if you ever had a licensed contractor financially harm you in any way, you can go to the, the uh, I think it's the, it's not the FREC, it's the DBPR, but mm -hmm. they have a, a Florida Homeowners Recovery Fund, and they will actually give you the money. They will reimburse you, and they will suspend that contractor's license. And then they will, it's very similar to the real estate industry. I think realtors have mm -hmm. something similar. But that contractor can no longer practice until they've reimbursed the fund. And uh, so it gives it gives them an avenue to get um, made whole, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I would suggest. That's a, that's a reason why you'd hire a licensed contractor, mm -hmm. not just because they're probably more experienced, but because you know if you have a bad experience, you know, there's then, a checks and balances behind right. it. Right. Exactly. There's accountability. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Exactly. So great advice. Joke. Time. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Joke time. Joke time. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, this one's probably my favorite. It's probably the corniest, but it's my favorite, right? And and uh, you know, actually, I met a guy that told me this story. The what? Don't the ruin it. You, you want you want that one? That's yeah. a good one too. That's a good oh, one God. too. All right, let's do whatever the one, one you want. <laughs> let's do the priest one. Let's do the priest one. So, so yeah, the 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 pastor hired a contractor to come and paint his church, right? And so the, on the day the contractor he shows up, and the pastor's super excited. He says, "Look." You know, this is my church. This is the home for my congregation. And we've been here for many, many years, and we're getting it painted for the first time. So I want you to take particular uh, attention to the steeple of the church, okay? Contractor says, you got it, no problem. So the contractor starts painting the building, and he paints the face of the building, does a great job. He gets to the side of the building, and his assistant says, hey, boss, 
you know, we're running out of paint here. What, what, what should we do? And the boss says, don't worry. I know just what to do. So he takes a little paint thinner and he adds it into the paint and it stretches for the, for the side of the building. And they get, they get to the back of the building and the helper says, hey, you know, boss, we're running out of paint again. What do we do? He says, no problem. I know just what to do. So he adds a little bit more thinner, right? And they get to the steeple of the building. And at this point, they're just putting on painted water. It's just, you know, white water that they're putting on there. And so they're wrapping up, they're cleaning up. And the pastor gets back to the, to the church and he sees the front of him. He says, glory of God, this is miraculous. Love what you've done here. And then he gets to the side of the building. He says, well, maybe we've fallen from grace a little bit here, you know, but he gets to the, he says, thinners, thinners, repaint and never thin again. <laughs> so that's the joke. That's the joke. <laughs> you they're know, I corny, think it, but they're funny. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, you know, the number one dad joke, you know, in the book. But I think it goes off a lot better in an audience that's really open and accepting. You know, you got 45 seconds to make these jokes in our group. Are those usually and, your commercials, jokes? You know, they were for a while. They were for a while. And then the well ran dry. All got right. It. There was nothing left in there. I started repeating the old jokes. You I'm going to have to chat GPT, see if I can find mortgage jokes for uh, to use. <laughs> I don't know if it will work. But all right, Patrick, thank you so much for coming on. If you could just Thanks give uh, give the audience your uh, your whatever you want to give them, social media, your cell phone, whatever you want. So if anyone's interested website. in any painting website and for your painting services, for the garage epoxy floor services, contracting services. So what's the best way for someone to reach you? Yeah, I'd really, I really encourage everybody to visit atriumpaint.com. Uh, that's my painting website. We also have a new website that's atriumconstructionfl.com. And that's a great place to get all of our contact information. Um, they can always reach my office, 561-929-9049. Uh, but yeah, the website's probably the best place to go. It's sort of like new and you know, spark, you know, got that new car smell on it. So I, it's I got a new coat, coat of paint. paint. Yeah, Fresh coat of paint. Go. Oh my God. Why, how did I not think of that? <laughs> no kidding. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We'll put all that contact information in the, uh, in the show notes. And uh, thank you so much for being on Patrick. Been a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Patrick. Lot. Absolutely. Okay. That's enough whining for one day. We are so happy that you could join us today on Stop Whining About Real Estate. So please, not only listen, but subscribe, follow us, download, share, and if you're feeling it, give us a five-star review. Hey, and if you'd like to be a guest on the show, please email stopwhining at choicemortgage.com. Thanks so much.